Great. So um, this is where I take over just briefly to say a little bit about food, how this relates to uh, food security and, and our food, our food global food system. Uh, a couple of things is we have a food system that's predicated on the notion of stable climate. That should be clear at this point. Um, and, and it's not likely to remain stable. It's also a system that's fundamentally probably much too simple for us to be comfortable with. When you think that two-thirds of the calories we consume come from three species, uh, that provides a, a very sort of a, a much a simplistic base to work from. And the, you know, the Green Revolution, which is largely credited for allowing us to sustain food production in this period of massive population growth, um, was largely a function of changes to those three crops. There were changes in new varietal inputs, large inputs of nitrogen, and lots of increases in, in, in uh, irrigation. The result, these are synergistic effects. They work really well together. Ir nitrogen inputs work a lot better in an irrigated crop without it, for example. The result is that we've got now a large proportion of the world's food coming from a much smaller portion of agricultural land, about 20%. That's the irrigated land because irrigated crops with high nitrogen do so well. This you know, produces an interesting sort of push and pull between water, between water use and, and food use because it does, those are irrigated crops do think are so, are so intensive from a water standpoint. Um, the, the, the point, I guess, from moving forward is that we had a green revolution that resulted in 2%, perhaps more, yield increases globally per year. Um, we still have that demand, but we're not producing that anymore. In fact, cereal productions are peaked out around 1975. And so we're now, we're looking at, you know, even stepping back from climate change, we're looking at a system that for, you know, a large proportion of the world is already broken. You've got about one-fifth of the world's population which lack food, that lack basic food security. Um, and I want to focus the rest of the talk on that relationship between climate change and the population of the world that is already in, 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 a, in food, it does not have food security. Um, just as a aside, we're not, we're, 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 one of the reasons in which reason we're not seeing yield increases is because, well, there are two things. One is our increases in per, eight per hectare yield are declining. We're already reaching 70, perhaps 70% of theoretical yields on the field, which means we can't go up as much as we could before, except perhaps in Africa. Um, and we're also losing a lot of the area we could use. So most of our yield increases are efficiency gains, and now we're losing area. So those are two reasons that are sort of combining. So if we think about this population of people, approximately a billion people currently that don't have enough food right now, climate change is almost surely to increase that number, that population size. The range is going to, the, the, how much is, is not a, a large debate. We don't know how much, but we do know that these, these populations are among the most vulnerable. Um, and most of these populations are in either, in fact, about 95% are either in tropical or in subtropical habitat. So the food insecure are primarily in the tropics. When we look at agricultural production statistics, um, what we what one of the most the, the most common trends, the most robust trends, is that we predict larger declines in agricultural production in tropical countries. And this is based primarily on the physiology of crops and how that's related to changes in climate. So just looking at crop physiology, we see large declines. I'm going to see if I can use this pointer correctly. Yeah, um, in the dark red areas here, most of them are tropical. This, um, this map here is probably a closer representation of what we might project than this map here, given current understanding of the, the impact of CO2 fertilization on crop yields. So when we take this back down from a community level to an individual crop level, we can also see the same sort of statistics. Um, this population of a billion people get about 50% of their calorie, calories from these three crops. All three of them show, throw much, show much larger projected declines in tropical countries than they do in temperate countries. So here are those, here's that data here from the IPCC report, um, in which the solid line represents projected declines in maize, wheat, and rice with local temperature increases ranging in here. The dotted line is the same crops in temperate latitudes, or you sometimes see even increases. So um, these are sort of the most optimistic projections in some respects that include CO2 fertilization. Um, as I said, the, the, the sort of the, 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 one of the main problems here is, is this Okay, there we go. Um, it is that we have this sort of congruence between the map up, up in this corner here, which I just showed you, and WH, uh, the World Food Program's sort of map of where the undernourished or the people who lack food security are today. There's a, a rough congruence between the places where we're, we're losing agricultural productivity and the places that people already lack food security. 
just as a sort of reference, Sub-Saharan Africa, you've got 40% of the people there living at less than a dollar a day. 70% of those people are rural farmers that depend critically on local agricultural production. Local agricultural production is declining. So this is sort of already, already a, a, a series. This is more than just a nutritional problem. It's a, it's a humanitarian problem as well. Um, so I want to sort of finish with just talking about what ecology can bring to this table um, and how ecologists can sort of help understand and maybe do a better job of predicting specific impacts um, so that we can plan mitigation and adaptation strategies. So what I've shown you today is almost entirely this model. We know how temperature and precipitation, we have predictions of temperature and precipitation change. We know, some, we know something about the relationship between these variables and crop physiology. We use that to predict crop yield. We get a map like this. What we don't generally do is look at independent impacts that insects produce. And there's a good, and so insects are one of the main reasons we can't reach theoretical yield potentials in fields because they consume lots of lots of the, the crop in the field for most of our major grains. They're also not likely to respond um, in the same way across the, across the globe. And as a matter of fact, most of our data to date suggests that there we'll see larger increases in insects in the temperate zone, not in the tropics, based on two basic principles. These maps are, are generic models. The, the top one shows you how metabolism and consumption, essentially how much an insect will need to eat just to, to grow, will change through, will change, oh, look at that, zero on that, okay. Um, will change, the bottom one is essentially how population growth will change. Population growth of insects should change. These models both suggest increases in populations in the temperate zones and either decreases or much slower increases in the tropics. This is a fundamentally different picture than what we're seeing with just crop physiology. So it suggests a need to look closely at how these interact. Rice production, shown right here, for example. High rice yields throughout Eastern Asia, particularly Northeastern Asia. That's the exact reason why we predict increases in population sizes and consumption rates of insects. We can use this information to target mitigation and adaptation strategies. And we should be starting to do that. And I hope, I hope we can actually make these much more specific. So understanding specific pests, understanding their specific impacts, their physiologies, how they relate to yield requirements of crops. Quickly summarizing then, by 2100, we expect growing season temperatures very likely to exceed the warmest on record throughout much of the tropics. The impacts in the tropics and the temperate zones will not be from the same drivers necessarily. Major physiological limitations on food production in, the tri in many tropical countries often caused by interactions with temperature and precipitation. In temperate areas, potentially large reductions due to insect pest increases. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. <coughs>